All right. So thank you all for being here and uh, welcome to the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization, for which I am the very proud director. Uh, as we do at Deakin, uh, we'd like to comment and start by acknowledging that we are meeting on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and uh, pay our respects to their leaders, past, present, but more importantly, acknowledge that these lands, these shores have never been ceded voluntarily and that the struggle for justice and reconciliation is an ongoing one. Uh, the, a the Alfred Deakin Institute of Citizenship Globalization, which we like to call just ADI, it's much easier to say it, rather than the full title, is a social sciences and humanities research institute. So we conduct research driven by expertise and disciplines like sociology and politics and anthropology and uh, history and international relations. But we don't just like to do the research and publish the books and the papers. What we like to do also is to really engage in talking about current issues uh, that are of interest to our communities and our society. And I think you will agree with me that there is nothing much more current, if you like, much more topical, much more polarizing in many ways than the events that are taking place and unfolding in the Middle East, specifically the war that is raging on in, in, in Gaza. People say since October the 7th, but of course it's not since October the 7th. It's been going on for decades now. And October the 7th is just one of the latest, if you like, manifestations of this conflict. It is extremely, of course, uh, difficult at times to talk about such, such conflicts. And we are seeing uh, how it's impacted communities in Australia, but also in, our, in other societies. It really manifests and reflects the spillover of international conflicts within multicultural societies. And uh, Australia is not immune to that, which is why we are absolutely delighted tonight that we have uh, a really uh, very well um, thought out, if you like, a series of questions that we would like to uh, explore with our panelists. And we have a very good panel uh, that comprises uh, people who have been in, active in this space from different perspectives, from community perspective, from scholarly perspective, from a legal, if you like, point of view, but all of whom, I think, and I hope, share a common orientation and a common commitment. And that is that we are all driven by a strong uh, orientation with respect for the sanctity of human life, with respect for struggles against oppression, with respect for a pursuit of justice that is inclusive, that is durable, and that doesn't discriminate. So we think whatever you want for yourself, you should want for the others. And I think that is really the commitment that we all want to adhere and we want to align ourselves and our ethical, if you like, orientations with. So without further ado, I will not introduce the panel because uh, my, my colleague, Professor Greg Biden from the ADI, will be both chairing and coordinating the conversations and Greg will be uh, introducing them. So let me just introduce Greg, who is a, a chair in ADI in, in Global Islamic Politics. And uh, Greg is, uh, you probably, many of you would, would be very familiar with Greg. He's a regular commentator on international politics, including events that unfold in, in the Middle East, but in particular around Asia. So without further ado, over to you, Greg. Thank you, Fetty. And uh, because we, I mean, it's, it's so important that we acknowledge the original owners of this country because we're talking uh, this question of country and place and belonging is central to most topics, but certainly this topic tonight. So um, I will start with the um, the video clip that we use to um, more fully speak about um, our acknowledgement of country. Deakin University would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of all the unceded lands, skies and waterways on which our students and staff come together as we learn, teach, innovate and research through virtually and physically constructed places across time, we pay our deep respect to the elders and ancestors who have cared for the country that you join us from. An ancient place where education, innovation 
and knowledge transfer have taken place for many thousands of years. At Deakin, we aim to nurture and continue this important legacy whilst encouraging our communities to walk softly on country in the spirit of sustainability. In particular, we give gratitude to the elders and ancestors of Wadawurrung country, Wurundjeri country, and Eastern Ma country and beyond, where our physical campuses are located. Their contributions to our learning communities and environments are rich and highly valued. Deakin is committed to embedding indigenous knowledges and perspectives in all disciplines that we teach, as well as advancing the self-determined interests of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, including treaty and truth-telling. As you move around our physical and virtual environments, take a moment to consider, appreciate, and listen deeply to the country beneath your feet. I'm going to introduce our panel briefly. It's tempting to say a lot about each one of them, but I know that we're going to get to 7.30 and we do have a sort of firm um, rule here that we do the 90 minute period and, and um, the people who run the Deacon Downtown will make sure that we're out of the doors not long after 7.30, so that's, that's the way it works. We always leave um, wanting more time and just feel like we're in the middle of a conversation. In a way, that's kind of a good thing, but it's good that we had hours to get into tonight's topic. Uh, but let me not take up too much of that precious time that we have by saying too much. So um, we have on our panel um, uh, Yusuf al Rimawi, who is founder of Palestine Remembered. Uh, he he uh, works at Radio 3CR. He's also a translator and interpreter. Uh, is an expert in Arabic text, so he, he works in um, proofreading and Ara uh, Arab culture and, of course, particularly Palestine. He also is a musician, and I hope he will tell us a little bit about the Tarab ensemble, ensemble that he he leads. It's a contemporary um, uh, Arabic music group. Um, I, di I didn't want to, to impose on him too much, but I was very tempted to ask him to do something tonight. We won't, we won't impose on him music-wise, but I hope we hear about it. Uh, Sheree Krebs is Professor of Law and Director of the Centre for Law as Protection at Deakin University. Um, she's also an Affiliate Scholar at uh, Stanford University Centre for International Security and Cooperation and elected Chair of the Liba Society on the Law of Armed Conflict. Uh, Michelle Lesh is, so uh, Sheree from Deakin Law. M Michelle Lesh is a Senior Fellow at Melbourne Law School. Um, she's also taught at the London School of Economics. Um, uh, she's worked at the UN as an international lawyer on the UN Commission of Inquiry into the Gaza protests uh, for the UN Special Rapporteur on the Occupied uh, Palestinian Territory. And she's worked for many years on the uh, Israel-Palestinian um, uh, conflict as a legal advisor at a governmental, intergovernmental and uh, non-governmental level. She's also on the board of, of the Red Cross, the International Humanitarian Law Advisory Committee, um, International Council for New Israel Fund and Officer for the International Bar Association for War Crimes Committee. So, I mean, our, our lawyers know what they're speaking about when it comes to this, but we'll hear from them shortly. And Andrew, who I'm going to ask to start off with the opening comments, we'll have a brief series of opening comments from the four and then into some discussion with the panel and then we'll throw to you for questions from the floor. I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. So Andrew is a lecturer in uh, Middle East politics at Deakin. Uh, he chairs the Middle East Studies course, um, which covers everything from Middle Eastern history through to contemporary politics, uh, including particularly the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, he has a PhD from Monash and is expert in studying not critical non-Western approaches to uh, Iranian foreign policy, which may come up tonight, possibly. Uh, but enough enough for me on comments. And Andrew, I'll ask you to speak for, you know, three, five minutes, and then um, I think we're going to uh, then ask... Um, uh, Michelle, and then Yusuf, if that's okay, Yusuf, uh, and then get uh, Sheree to bring up the, the final comments before we move into our discussion. Okay. Everyone can hear me? Great. All right. Um, well, it's hard to know where to start with something like this. Um, I've been teaching Palestinian-Israeli conflict for a few years now. Um, and it is uh, it's worth repeating what Fethi said, which which is that this is this current situation that we find ourselves in in Gaza um, is not the beginning of a conflict. This is a continuation of one. Um, where we are now is just the latest incarnation of a conflict that's been occurring over seventy five years. So it is hard to know where to start, um, and 
to how to how to start a conversation like this. Um, but while the humanitarian context is incredibly important, and we obviously are going to be talking about that today, um, uh, we will talk about it. Um, I think the best place to start is broadly, uh, in particular the geopolitics and the um, and the international order aspect of this conflict, because um, there are if we're talking about the future of Gaza, that is where a lot of the change, damage, and even potential hope, which is hard to say and hard to hard to conceptualize, is going to um, is going to sorry is going to occur. Um, so immediately, there are quite a lot of there's already quite a lot of damage done to the international order because of the Gaza conflict. Uh, the immediate regional geopolitics are incredibly concerning. Uh, as we've seen over the last few days, the um, assassination of Ismail Haniyeh has set off a, um, a kind of a cavalcade of events that have, may potentially bring Iran into a conflict, um, almost certainly will eventually bring Lebanon and Hezbollah into a conflict, into a conflict with Israel. Uh, and as a result, putting pressure on, um, on other states in the region. Um, not only that, but the, the actual, uh, the, the fighting in Gaza is, is putting pressure on Egypt, uh, putting, putting significant strain on the relationship between uh, Israel and Egypt, which has been uh, something that's been normalized since the Camp David Accords. Uh, the other damage has been done has been to US exceptionalism as a, uh, as a kind of pole bearer, standard bearer for the international order. Um, and uh, rallying the world around its exceptionalism for the liberal international order. That is that it can't be overstated how much damage has been done in this conflict to that status. Um, but also in the same breath, the empowerment of actors like Iran uh, as um, from the perspective of the liberal international order uh, is undoubtedly counterproductive um, to, to their aims. But also the empowerment of the of the view from China and Russia, which is not entirely untrue in this context, that the liberal world order only serves its own interests and not actually the interests of a cosmopolitan future, meaning uh, the the people of the world. So there is, and I want to get to the hope because I'm really kind of grasping at trying to make this a more hopeful conversation. We have all been seeing this unfold in front of our eyes, um, and we can't we we can't look away, but at the same time, there is some hope that we can look to. Um, hopefully this will mean the death knell of uh, peace through victory discourses in this conflict. Undeniably, the Israeli approach has not worked in the, in the Gaza conflict and it isn't working. And hopefully this idea of the fact that Israel has won this conflict, uh, which overshadows ideas about um, affording uh, self-determination to the Palestinian people uh, is is gone because it's clearly not working. Uh, the UN institutions, with the help of Global South states, are holding their ground and are attempting to push back against this idea that um, uh, that the international order has to be cynical, has to be political in this sense. Um, we've seen, obviously, the ICC warrants uh, issued against uh, not only uh, Yaya Sinwa and um, uh, Ismail, Ismail Haniyeh, who's just been killed, but also Yov Galant, the Defence Secretary, and Benjamin Netanyahu himself. But also just the other day, Turkey has joined uh, South Africa in its charge against uh, Israel for the crime of genocide. Um, and there does appear, however slight, however, um, however uh, insufficient, a shift in US policy towards this conflict. Um, just uh, long before, um, if you had asked me if, uh, if the United States was ever gonna condition any aid to Israel ever, I would have said never. Um, that's changing. And career, uh, career public servants in defense are resigning. Uh, pressure is being put on the US uh, in, terms of its, of, in terms of its interest in this conflict. A lot of that has to do with grassroots activism. A lot of that has to do with actual national security contexts. But what is for certain is that the conflict is not sustainable in its current form, at least geopolitically, domestically, regionally, or globally. And a ceasefire is the only short-term remedy. In terms of a longer-term remedy, 
is the international community led by its most powerful states must push for and platform a political solution, namely the sovereignty of Palestinians in their own lands. So hopefully we'll have some interesting questions on that, but I'll, um, I'll hand it over to Greg. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Excellent summing up. You didn't give us an answer for peace in the Middle East. I, I wasn't going to ask you for one, but you certainly you pointed to the foundation that needs to be there if we're to make progress. Um, I'll pass to you, Michelle. Thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's an honour to be on this panel. And thank you, Greg and the ADI and um, Andrew for this um, great introduction and setting the kind of geopolitical landscape and some of the trends and patterns that you've acutely observed. I think I'll pick up a bit from the last point, not that I um, can offer any you know, magic solutions, but just under this topic, which is the future of Gaza and what can be done. So I take this topic to mean what should we hope for when the war is over and what can be done realistically to actually try and achieve that and try and achieve some change. And I want to discuss a couple of pathways that I think might bring us closer to realising that hope and perhaps develop them further during the discussion time. So I think obviously the most urgent task um, is going to be the reconstruction of Gaza. And this needs to be done in a way that's consistent with the determination by all parties that are going to be involved, as you mentioned, Andrew, to create the conditions for political self-determination for all Palestinian peoples. And it must be a form of political self-determination that would be a just recognition, both politically and territorially, of the significance of their dispossession. I also think, though, that there won't be a Palestinian state from the river to the sea any time in the near future. No Israeli government would consent to it, and Palestinians will achieve only what Israel will consent to right now, and albeit under considerable pressure, which should be placed on Israel from the international community. So for the foreseeable future, I think Israel will exist as a state on which the Jewish people realise their need for political self-determination and only military defeat of Israel could change that. And I don't think that's going to happen because Israel, for example, has nuclear weapons. And I think supporters of Palestine should recognise this and equally supporters of Israel must recognise that unless it consents to the full realisation of the Palestinian need for self-determination, self it will be justifiably regarded as a pariah state in the community of nations and among most peoples of those nations. And no one who cares for Israel should wish that upon it, not even after how this terrible war that it has waged against Gaza and its people. So if we kind of think about what that might look like, I, like many, um, think it's hard to see how a two-state solution is possible in the near future or, or ever, actually, without an Israeli civil war following attempts to forcibly remove ideologically intransient settlers. And if that is so, then Israel must eventually be prepared to renounce its present form as a sovereign state and see ways of realising its and the Palestinians' need for self-determination in the land between the river and the sea. But this, I don't think, will happen unless there's military security for both people and that that is somehow guaranteed. And now another pathway that I just want to mention briefly and I'm happy to go into in discussion is the legal pathways forward. So I hope that the legal procedures and legal interventions that we've seen that have been put in motion by the International Criminal Court, um, the ICC, and also the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, played themselves out so that the horrific events since and including October 7th in terms of the jurisdiction, but ICC precedes that, um, we don't lose sight of the importance of international law. And when one's tempted to despair about what seems to be 
the impotence of international law to preventing terrible crimes. It's important to remember the what is the expressive function of law in creating or validating social norms, even when punishment might be unlikely. Because <clears throat> when people are done a terrible injustice, uh, injustice, what they cry for is justice, or at least recognition that that is what they deserve, rather than just only material compensation. And I don't think that they can receive justice or the recognition that they need it if the true, true nature of the crimes that are committed against them are not properly recognised. And in the national arena, recognition of wrongs done to fellow citizens is a condition of community. In the international arena, the recognition and the proper naming of crimes committed against citizens of other nations is a condition of the existence of the community of nations. And that's why we must ensure that crimes are given the right names and not yield to the temptation to believe it doesn't matter to most people if what they have suffered is to be called genocide or a crime against humanity driven by the fury of revenge, contemptuous of the humanity of its victims. I think it's important to remember this when we're tempted, as many have been, um, because of the current case brought by South Africa at the ICJ, to broaden the concept of genocide in order to make it a more effective tool for punishing perpetrators of mass killings and for reducing their number. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. That's uh, clear and concrete. Once again, we don't have answers, but we know where we have to start looking for the answers and the issues we need to address. And, and um, do you want to? That's okay. Sure. Can everybody hear me without the mic? Okay, good. Yeah, that mic on the lectern works fine too. So okay, good. I'll so I might just pass this on to you. Because we like nonverbal communications you know, in the Arab world. Yeah, you need to see your hands. <laughs> <laughs> the future of Gaza, what can be done? What if there is no future for Gaza? What if the genocide keeps happening? What this 10 month plus genocide is going to be a year plus, two year plus. There's clear evidence that we have gotten used to it. There's clear evidence, not, not just Australia, not just the international community, not just the West, not just the neutral, not just the anti-Palestinian, but even, even the, the Arab world, the Islamic world, and maybe some pro-Palestinians are now not as appalled as in the first month or two. So what if there is no future for Gaza? What if Gaza becomes in, uninhabitable? And indeed, Gaza is uninhabitable. And it has been for five years. You may have seen reports from the United Nations. I was in a meeting in 2016 in Canberra when the top UNRWA guy visited Australia for fundraising and warned us that th things stay like this without genocide, without war, Gaza is running out of water, not to mention unemployment, not to mention the social, economic, and the list is very long. And Gaza went from the world's biggest open air prison to the world's biggest open air grave. And we cannot say we don't know in the time of social media when there is every day hundreds and maybe thousands and maybe tens of thousands of pictures and images and footage not to prove, but to document the genocide. We have visual and audio and writing image. Two days ago, I wrote a post in Arabic language and I said, exclusive to the people of Gaza, only the people of Gaza can comment on this. I'm going to talk to Australians on Thursday about you guys. So if you have some messages you want to share, do so. And let me translate some of these comments. Sama, I spent six months in this hell, and today I'm far, and I have become, I, I have come to know that there is another hell called statelessness. Montasser, life in Gaza 
it can be summarized by 300, 300 days of sound of drones, which deprives you from listening to a song, from as simple as listening to a song. And tomorrow is my birthday, and I'm deprived from playing a song and enjoying it for five minutes even. Abu Rabia said, one word, hell. People in Gaza have lost its humanity. There are queues everywhere to water, to toilets, sometimes an hour plus. Riyadh said, I have missed the stones of my house. Mustafa said, the homes are empty, the walls are weeping, the streets are sad. People here are nothing but dried tears. Zahir said, Yusuf, please tell them that we are worthy of decent life. Tell them, send them my salam, and tell them that we appreciate any support they do for us. Lastly, Khalid, he said, we listen to the sound of missiles and first try to escape this, the missiles, but then head towards where the missiles are so we could die because comfort in Gaza is in death. What if there's no future in Gaza? And if, if we want to talk about the day after, we have to ask the day before. The day before, not just in Gaza, but th the day before for the Palestinians worldwide. We are 14 million around the world. There are 2.2 in Gaza. There are 2.8 in West Bank. There is 0.4 in Jerusalem. There's 1.5 in Israel. There is 7 plus million in exile. And Israel has imposed on each and every one of the 14 million one of, re one of six realities, depending on where we are. In Gaza, the reality is tightened siege, blockade for 17 years now. And before that, Second Intifada, and before that, a little bit of Palestinian Authority rule, and before that, occupation since 1967, and before that, the 56 canal, uh, Suez Canal crisis, and before that, the expulsion of, on the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians neighboring Gaza. And today, Gaza is home for three quarters of the population of Gaza are originally refugees. So that, that's the first reality. Second reality in West Bank, it's the reality of direct military occupation. And it's an area of 5,840 square kilometers. It's similar to metropolitan Melbourne. And with direct military occupation, then you have soldiers, you have nitrates, you have the separation wall that Israel calls security fence. You have checkpoints, more than 500 checkpoints, including what we call al-hawajiz al-tayyara, flying checkpoints. They set up for one day, and then they remove it the next day. And then you have the imprisonment, the killing, the raids. So the violence in the West Bank that's affecting the West Bank is coming predominantly from soldiers, but not exclusive, because there is also the violence of settlers, 900,000 settlers. Not every settler in the West Bank is ideological settler. Some of them, maybe most of them, are economic. They are there because the government provides them with some subsidy. But some of the, economy, the, the ideological settlers believe that they are there on a sacred and divine mission of ethnically cleansing the remaining Arabs in the West Bank for divine reasons. And the violence of the settlers went from 20 attacks per year to 321 attacks in 2021. And none of these attacks are actually uh, investigated properly, uh, even when we take them to Israeli courts. Not, I mean, I, I can say none of these attacks. And these attacks are not only, not only turned blind eye by the government, sometimes encouraged by the government, by the Knesset, by the court, and by the rabbis. So the reality in West Bank is direct military occupation. And West Bank, what Israel wants from West Bank is to deny the Palestinian state, 
there's no future state for Palestinians to the river, to the west of the river. But also, West Bank has become a laboratory for Israeli technology, CCTV and the, arm, the, the, the army technology. And Israel is able to sell its weapons with competitive and big, uh, good prices because of us, because we are their testing lab laboratory. And also Israel wants to achieve cheap labor uh, uh, to work in 48 areas. So that's reality number two. Reality number three is in Jerusalem. So if you are in Jerusalem, your life is different to your life. If you are a Palestinian in Al-Quds, your life is different to the Palestinians in Ariha, in Al-Khalil, in Ramallah, in uh, Tul Karim, in Jenin. In what way? In, in Jerusalem, Israel is imposing the reality of de-Arabization, revoking the permanent residency, and trying to make the demography less Arabs, more Jewish. And they do that with a long list of policies affecting now um, 350 to 400,000. And even the type of settlements in West Bank is different to the type of settlements in Jerusalem. It's called al istitan al-Jaybi. In addition to settlement on the top of the hills, there are settlements, the, the pocket style, the enclaved style settlements. Sometimes they occupy a building in a suburb, suburb or an apartment in a building or a roof on an apartment, and then they put up the Israeli flag, and then they get guards to protect it, and then they turn the life of the neighborhood into Jahim Hill. So the third reality in Jerusalem is the reality of de-Arabization, of Judaization. Fourth reality, affecting 1.5 million Palestinian holders of Israeli passports. They call them the Arab Israelis. They call them, uh, they should be citizens. But in Israel made a distinction between who is a citizen and who is a member of the nation. And there is the nation state bill that went in the Knesset in 2018, where it denied, it made it legal, it made it legal to discriminate against the Arabs of Israel. And it made it, uh, uh, the, uh, the right of self-determination is exclusive to the Jewish nation of the passport holders of Israel. Which means if you are an Arab, then you are, not only you are a second class citizen, you are a fifth class citizen after the European Jews, the Eastern Jews, the Russian slash Ukrainian Jews, the Falasha Jews, and then comes the Arab. And within the Arab, there is a hierarchy. If you serve in the army, then you are better off if you don't serve in the army. And then, and then, and then, fragmenting, fragmenting. And the fifth reality is the reality of people like me, people like my wife, Wissam people like all the, the seven point something million Palestinians who were made refugees in ethnic cleansing in 48. In 48, the population of Palestine was 1.4 million. 900,000 lost their homes, were ethnically cleansed by violence from November 49, from November 47 to January 49. This is what we call Nakba. Nakba has two pillars, the expulsion of people, the theft of land. Now. 900,000 became refugees in 48 areas, and now we're 7 million. I mean, we do breed. Um, our families are relatively bigger uh, uh, than maybe the majority of other uh, families. Now, the 7.2 million, first they were made refugees, you know, but do you know what our name is in their books? We are absentees. We, we just didn't turn up. So they made us refugees, and then they called us absentees and then they issued a bill called the absentee law the law of absence the absentees and then they confiscated our properties based on that it's it's legal including my grand grandfather's house in Safad to the north of occupied palestine and then the reality for the 7.2.3 million palestinian refugees is the denial of return and then the interference in the conflicts in the middle east and let them suffer more. And we've seen that in the Lebanese civil war. We've seen that in the current Syrian civil war. And you just stay where you are. You suffer. We don't care. You will never be returned. And we will never implement the right of return. The final reality is the only reality that us Palestinians get to meet. We're no longer fragmented. And it's in the Israeli prisons. Only in Israeli prisons where a Palestinian from Jerusalem meets a Palestinian from West Bank or from Gaza or from 48 or, or a refugee or a pro-Palestine Arab.
and the reality of Israeli prison is itself is a series of talks. So in time and uh, what the future of Gaza cannot be discussed in in detachment of the of these six realities the day before. So if you want to talk about the future of Gaza in the occupation, the, the first day of peace comes after the last day of occupation. We cannot talk about peace when your boot is on my, sh on, on my neck. End occupation, then we start a, a process of reconciliation, and then compensation, and then justice, maybe. Shukran, thank you. Thank you very much, Yusuf. Thank you, Yusuf, that's really clear. I wish it was, I wish the reality of things was not so clear. It's, it's a grim reality, but it's, it, it's where we have to start from. Um, so I'm very gladly pass the microphone now to Cherie to uh, perhaps point to some of the ways we might be looking at going. Oh, actually. Oh, sure. Okay, so uh, that's a, <laughs> a tough uh, <laughs> um, act to follow. Uh, I think uh, I thank you for um, for everything you said, which I think we are mostly you know um, in agreement on, and I think. Um, I kind of was planning to, to raise other issues, but following your very powerful uh, comments, Yusuf, I think perhaps what I should talk about is people. Because I, I think, you know, reading out the quotes from actual people currently um, living the hell that, you know, is Gaza these days, um, this is what we should be talking about, right? And I think by kind of, so this is a complicated conflict, right? And if we want to explore its history, it's always complex. If we want to talk about the different types of legal regimes and the legal interventions, there are so many. And sometimes it's really difficult to even cover them in a, you know, in a university course. And I think if we really want to think about the future of Gaza, and the future of the Middle East and the future of um, humanity, perhaps, we really need to start thinking and putting people and humans in um, at the core of how we think about the conflict. I think that processes of radicalization and processes of dehumanization are exactly what enables this violence to currently occur and continue day after day after day. And I think that, sadly, some of the interventions that we see on you know, social media and in other kind of forums exacerbate this radicalization and dehumanization. And I think what really needs to happen right now is for us to come together as humanity, as humans, as people in camaraderie, to think about how we can see the faces of people and treat every person as human. And I think, you know, you kind of, in one of those quotes, you mentioned the, the buzzing of the drone. So this is a core aspect of my research on uh, killer drones and their role in dehumanization during conflict. Um, and I think that part of the process is that we don't see people, right? So when we use this kind of vertical gaze from above, what we see are ants or black dots or what we see is signals right and that is a part of the dehumanization that enables this continuous you know violence and i think i mean we we've uh, i'm sure you know many of us read the horrible or horrific evidence coming from israel recently on um, the torture in its detention facilities this is the, you know, the ultimate kind of outcome of years of dehumanization of the Palestinian people within Israel. And obviously, I think um, the violence of October 7 is also a result of dehumanization um, process um, that happened in Gaza. Everything, of course, has its context and its reasons, right? But ultimately, it's... Um, uh, it's violence that is enabled because we don't look at people, because we think about security of regional arrangements. We're trying to think about what may work or what, what may be feasible. And I think with this long conflict, as the years go by, 
the feasibility of a long lasting solution seems to be going less and less possible, right? So, you know, we uh, from, um, you know, peace processes that were in some negotiation that were happening throughout the years, some of them were really on the verge of reaching some sort of solution that would allow people to live with freedom and dignity in, in that area. But as the years go by, um, I think definitely radicalization within Israel um, is intensifying its violence, intensifying um, um, suffering, and making a political solution less likely. And so what we can do in this situation where, I mean, the two-state solution, which seemed, you know, almost possible just in 2000, right? That wasn't that long ago. It was so close. Um, it didn't work. Why didn't it work? I think one of the main reasons it didn't work was that for Israelis, the status quo was actually, you know, okay. I mean, it wasn't great. There are suicide attacks. The security is not, um, is not good. We can't, you know go out safely, um, but, you know, it was something that you can live with. It wasn't the case for Palestinians, right? Um, but that was, I think, at, um, at the core of uh, the failure of the Camp David Accord, Accords in, in 2000. And perhaps what we need to think right now, and I think October, the October 7th event perhaps, I mean, I was hoping at the time this might change this calculation that we can that Israelis can live with the conflict, right? Because that was a violence in a scale that no one uh, <laughs> you would like to think no one could think that's something we can tolerate in our in our daily routine, right? Um, but as um, um, and I think you said you said that as well. We get used to a lot of things. And the things that you can get used to are sometimes completely unbelievable. And things that were, we would have thought that are completely unacceptable and no one could live this way, you know, a few weeks goes by, a few years go by, and all of a sudden, actually, we're living in this hell and it just goes on. And so I'll just end by um, saying, um, and, and again, I, I kind of prepared comments and pathways and things, but I think I, Yusuf really kind of uh, um, uh, made me a bit emotional, I think. Uh, but I think if we want to think forward, we have to think about the dehumanization, the role of technologies, including drone, uh, predator drones in this dehumanization, and the role of the international community, especially in uh, enabling this sort of uh, dehumanization of actual people in whatever we do online. And if we think about kind of take back the core of our humanity, refusing to accept violence wherever we see violence, I think we have um, some hope for um, for a future, and at least this is the the very small hope that I try to cling to um, at this uh, at the you know heat of this of this nightmare that seems to be going on forever without any solution. And I think, uh, and and so I'll just end by perhaps going back to the issue of water, which again I think uh, Yusuf um, talked about. I think for us to to see the people in Gaza and in Israel as humans, the issue of water and some of the destruction of water resources currently going on in Gaza and in the West Bank is a core issue to consider. The environmental damage that has been going on is something that doesn't have a, you know, a kind of imagined border. Whatever the solution may be between Israel and Palestine, the environmental damage that we're seeing now in Gaza and the West Bank, the destruction of water sources, this is something that affects humans and animals and the ecosystems of the region wherever we are. And so I think this is, again, something that kind of transcends the, the type of borders or classifications that, uh, that we aim to put there. So I'll end with this, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shuri. Um...
I don't know what there is more to be said with our panel. It's it's uh, this is the reality that um, has to be acknowledged. We frame this conversation as the future of Gaza, uh, not because we're Pollyanna-ish and you know naively optimistic about everything coming right. Um, I think what Yusuf has said, we we can't argue with that. There is no peace without an end to occupation. The end to occupation, if we were very very optimistic, is still no doubt a long way down the road. There are a lot of stages. Um, I wonder whether we can explore some immediate stages for what might happen. Uh, the 2.2 million people in Gaza will increasingly succumb to uh, illness and and um, the hellish conditions they're in if they don't uh, they're not hit literally with uh, uh, bombs and 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 fire. It was it's it seems inconceivable that this conflict has gone on in its current form for 300 plus days. Um, so it would be naive to say it must surely end soon with the assassination of um, of Ismail Haniyeh, who was uh, some hope for negotiation, and, and his replacement now with Yahya Sinwar, who was the mastermind of the October seventh attack. It seems like there's just no basis for optimism at all. And yet, what's happening in Gaza can't be sustained for very much longer, one way or the other. So, what comes next? I mean, obviously, yes, we have to look to uh, human dignity and 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 respect. And we have to look to an end of occupation and self-determination. But what what realistically should we be looking for, and what should we be trying to you know contribute to that's um, that's possible? Uh, I mean, it, we're not going to get anything ideal or any quick solution, but there will have to be some changes. I mean, it it ends. I think Yusuf is spot on where they, there's no peace ongoing without an end to occupation that is the end that's it's not even the end point as Yusuf argued you know then maybe reconciliation then maybe um truth telling and 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 all of that stuff that's a that's a very long process as well um but I think ceasefire ceasefire is step one ceasefire can happen tomorrow ceasefire should happen tomorrow should have happened yesterday should have happened 300 days ago um that is the first that is the first thing that's the obvious thing that's what everybody believes to be true um as the first step uh the next is um and this gets to what michelle was saying about the fact that this um that you know we're, we're talking about uh, that that israel israel has the agency here and israel needs to to make choices and their first choice should be to kick out its current government uh that 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 benjamin netanyahu's government benjamin netanyahu um in, in general um should be nowhere near the prime ministership of Israel, um, with it take away uh, any any kind of um, any uh, cabinet position from people like Bezalel uh, Smotrich, Ben Gavir, um, people who are advocating for uh, the murder and torture of Palestinians um, in and dehumanization of Palestinians. That's that's step two, um, and then um, then yeah, I think it becomes less clear. I guess um, then it becomes about. Um, both, uh, I think, I think then it becomes about picking up the phone, the next leader of Israel picking up the phone and talking to the Palestinian Authority, uh, and acknowledging that this comes from this comes from a political place, and the only solution is a political one. Um, and from there, it becomes we're, we're again very far away from a solution, but we're at, we at least have we at least have we're we're looking at equals being treated as equal. Andrew, well, I echo much of what's been said here, and agree that you know the the place that it all has to start is the end of the occupation. And I think we all agree that if only you know, you know, it should have happened. So that I think there are a few things that are just go without saying, which was is that the occupation has to end, and hopefully international pressure will build and build on that because as we can see, we can't rely on Israel to um, do that itself. Um, I, I do think that the, the, limited, the legal interventions are limited, but I still think it's significant that the International Court of Justice has issued an opinion saying that the occupation is illegal. The occupation itself is illegal and Israel must take all steps to rapidly end that and we can already see responses of states like the new um, government in the UK have said it's going to consider ending arms supply. I know their arms contribution is not the same as the US, but 
there's hope now that Biden is towards the end of his um, presidency and he's not going for re-election, that he will put all pressure on Netanyahu in ways he hasn't until now to um, end the war and for a ceasefire to come about. Again, I think it goes without saying that a ceasefire needs to occur immediately um, and you know, there's agreement with that even in large parts of the population in Israel, including the military establishment. And I also agree with what Andrew says is that, you know, the hope is that there is these current government in Israel is out and, and goes. And I um, and my hope is is in the younger generation that that gets them out, even if that's for bad reasons of feeling not like that they're a pariah and they can't travel the world or whatever the reason is, but just to somehow have a transformation within a complete change of leadership and a leadership that is going to talk to uh, Palestinian politicians and create dialogue. And, you know, there are still different frameworks that are um, espoused by, you know, there are some people that were on the the negotiating team, Palestinians, Americans that are putting forth plans, and a lot of them say there's never a good time. It's not about waiting for the right government. It's not about waiting for the right people. It's now. So I just think, you know, all of that has to happen. It's it's not about waiting. And I guess just to pick up on the last point, because there is, is so much hatred, especially now, I just think in whatever way is possible, there needs to be ways of building trust between the two peoples and and the two communities, like on small scale level and on big scale, scale but just to try and create cr trust between the people where we can. Thank you. I just want to elaborate on two points, change and hope. We have to change our perception uh, where we keep approaching the Palestinians as variable and the Israelis as constant. Since 1948, when Nakba happened, when we became refugees, when I, when my grandfathers from both sides became uh, refugees, the world has changed in many ways. You can think of many international conflicts that took place in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, um, and you can take 10 minutes to recall even the names of them. And in that in that ocean of constants, there is one variable. There is the, in that ocean of variables, there is us, the constant here, when we remain refugees. So this has to change. The, the other thing is that when we approach the Palestinian issue, the Palestinian right of self-determination, the Palestinian right of a state, it's always in Australia and the West from the, the context of the Israelis. So let's recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Let's recognize Israel, uh, the security and safety of Israel and the Israeli uh, soldiers and the Israeli settlers and the security of the Israelis, the want-to-be's who will maybe become Israelis next year. And then maybe let's remember just to make it sound a little bit balanced. And also we'll, 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 uh, the right of Palestinians to a viable state. So that has to change. The other thing is what needs to change is the, the definition of who is and what is progressive. In the last 20 and 30 years, being progressive, those who have progressive views, we have seen we have seen movements, and you know about this more than I do, especially in Australia and the United States and the first world, first world, where progressive movement, if you have progressive views on climate change, where you do not deny global warming, and where you call for action to stop that, you can have progressive views when it comes to the right of minorities whatever these minorities are, could be migration, mi migrant minorities, Muslim minorities, LGBTQ minorities. You, have, you can have progressive views on the right of minorities. You can have progressive views on the rights of indigenous and first Australians. And now we started the session by acknowledgement and rightly so, and we should continue. And you can have progressive views on combating fascism when it comes and combating Islamophobia. Uh, uh, Islamophobia. And you can have a, a, a pro progressive views on many other things. But when it comes to Palestine, some organizations in Australia, some individuals are either silent or even worse, pro-Israel, and still call themselves progressive. And I think this needs to change. And that is why there is a term called progressive except Palestine, PEP. If you go to, if you look up progressive except Palestine, you will find pages, including a Wikipedia page, PEP. 
So this needs to change. You cannot get away and still consider yourself, I'm not talking to anyone in this room, but I'm talking about the concept of who is progressive. If you don't have a sympathetic view to Palestine, if or if you even worse are a supporter of Israel. And hope, I think hope comes from events like this. To us Palestinians, we, despite the despair, despite the destruction, despite the killing, which is irreversible damage, but, but there are good glimpses of hopes and the shift in the Palestinian representation in Australia is one manifestation. I've been participating and organizing Palestinian events since 2004, and only in the last few years where the Palestinian cause is no longer a community issue. It has become a little bit of mainstream where Australians talk to Australians about Palestine without having one Palestinian in the room. And this gives us a bit of hope. Um, we are no longer invisible. I'm sure some Palestinians might share the view with me when sometimes 20 years ago in Australia, where, when we are asked where you are from, and we say Palestine, and sometimes we often misheard as Pakistan. Or you have to say, where is Palestine? And you have to say, well, it, of course, we will resist saying Israel. We'll have to keep saying, well, it's, you know Lebanon, you know Jordan, you know Egypt, you know Syria, you know the Mediterranean, Tab Cyprus, Tab Malta. And then now we are no longer invisible. I think the hope is in, in, in building on the bridges that has emerged in the last 10 months. Australians who developed interest in Palestine and developed, developed sympathy, we should talk to them and we should not take them for granted. And that is a source of hope. Thank you for that. Um, so we both share uh, refugee heritage. My grandparents were also refugees. And I think when I think about the conflict and some of the intractability of the conflict, it goes back to, I think, this collective trauma of the Nakba for Palestinians and the Holocaust for um, for Jewish people. And I think a lot, um, a lot of missed opportunities um, perhaps are can be attributed at least to some extent to this collective trauma and its historical memories of reliving uh, this trauma, preventing um, processes that could lead to some um, solutions. So I will um, continue some of your thoughts on change, um, if that's okay. I think that change, at least, you know, within, I, I think actually not just in the Israeli side, perhaps, but, but maybe mainly, I think change will not come from within. I've, we've seen it fail again and again and again. And like I said in my comments before, the yeah. radicalization seemed to be intensifying. And I kind of lost hope on that change from within um, some years ago. And I've been, so I'm Australian, but I started my life as Israeli. And um, I've been a peace activist since I was 12. I was very politically active. And at the time, there was an active peace process that, you know, you could rally around. Um, still, there was not enough of a majority to make it, you know, stick. Uh, and the political leaders lacked the creativity, imagination and hope that a true, you know, peace required. But there was something to cling to and something to support. And I think, so when I left Israel in 2010, it was because I lost hope um, that any change can come from within. So after I... Um, um, I was a political activist. I was, you know, when, you know, when I grew up, <laughs> I became a lawyer. I mean, the, the whole point was, you know, to be able to bring change through um, political activity and legal activity. But, and, and I was working at the Israeli High Court of Justice for many years. But at some point, I lost hope. And I lost hope based on data. So I was involved in so many processes that failed that at some point I had to acknowledge the fact that there, there isn't going to be a process, that an, an internal process that leads to um, a reasonable solution that could be agreed upon, not just by Jewish Israelis among themselves. And so, um, 
And I think what we're seeing now is the complete, you know, kind of devastation of any type of hope for um, um, an internal domestic process among Jewish Israelis um, that can lead to a lasting just peace or any sort of a lasting fair uh, and just solution. And so what I think um, is the grain of hope is really um, perhaps not this room tonight because that's not enough, but ultimately the international pressure that will make Israel a pariah state and an outcast that would perhaps tip that sort of uh, domestic, um, you know, kind of calculation of people of, you know, what they are willing to suffer through, right? And obviously not suffer as a, as a you know, a genocide, but suffer through, you know, the man mundanities of, of life. Like if you can't travel overseas because your passport is not accepted, if you can't protect your family because other countries are not selling the weapons that you need to protect yourself, if you can't, you know, go on a holiday, if you can't, you know, have your things that you got used to having and they are now being taken away, that may tip some of that calculation for some people, not all. And so I think that international pressure is the way to go. And I think that beyond international pressure, um, it's not just the United States, which is a main player that sh should be pressured, but also... Um, Arab countries, um, European countries, the entire wo world is involved in, to some extent in this conflict through, you know, financial support, economic support, weapon transfers, and so forth. And I've just realized, so I was looking at some of the new kind of Israeli startup companies that uh, develop and sell small drones. So now you can, you know, control the, you know, the war through uh, one person can control a fleet of a thousand drones, right? Um, so those, uh, so this one company that I looked at, Extend, um, is partially funded by the European Union through some, you know, um, educational grants. Um, because drones, you know, they have all sorts of things that they can do, right? Not just, you know, kill people and terrorize them um, during war. You can fix it. <laughs> they can do a lot of things, sadly. Um, but um, but I think, you know, kind of un unraveling those type of weapon and financial support to weapon systems and to warfare, I think is crucial in, in, this, um, in this war. And I think um, before we can hope for peace, we can really hope for ceasefire. And that's kind of where I would put my, my effort these days. Thank you. Uh, look, such great content. I knew that we would start to run out of time um, way too early, and we only have, I think, what, 20-odd uh, minutes left. Um, so I'm going to take questions now from the floor, and that includes those who are online, if, if uh, Kira has anyone online who has a particular question. Um, so uh, if you've got a question, please raise your hand, and I might, I might cluster a few of them together. We can make it more efficient in terms of the way the panel answers. So we'll pass um, this little microphone going around. So over here, uh, Kira. I know, just just the people online. Oh, yeah, 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 they'll benefit from that. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for for the insightful information you you provided. But um, I still can't go past that uh, feeling of hopelessness. For everything that you mentioned is um, still not going to get us anywhere. So, um, and when you talk about international pressure, um, most of the large players and in, in international um, arena are pressured and uh, through different avenues. Um, so they depend on um, trade deals, and um, there's a lot of money invested um, in um, in their relationships. So thus, um, Arab countries um, will not say anything because they're depending on the income they're getting from the European and American countries. America is pretty much um, the mo most of the um, political um, class in America is um, supported by APAC, which is a pro-Israeli um, lobby. And so it is, uh, they can't do much either. They're under, under their control. 
Um, we turn to our neutral Switzerland, which is the UN, um, and which is supposed to be controlling um, the, the, the world. So never again um, was uh, UN was basically um, put together because never again after World War II. Yet the UN has lost so much credibility over the last 10 months where no one is listening to the UN. Um, how can we go past this? So the tomorrow that we're talking about is not going to be um, any good anyway, um, because nothing is changing. So what can we do other than what we are, the, the, the traditional way of, of, uh, of our thinking, yes, let's get to the UN, yes, let's put some pressure. That's not working. And we've seen it for the last 10 months. Thank you. Excellent question. I'm going to take um, one or two more and, and cluster them together so we can make good use of our time. I, I think um, there will be some answers to those. It's a really important question, and it's um, it's a it's a it's a yeah. Just be over here. Sorry, it is a grim situation, but it's it it it, it does look as if we're at the point where some things will change. We'll talk about unpack that. Thank you. Thank you very much to the panel as well, and very um, informative um, information. Uh, my uh, area of interest is to see how discussions like this can lead to um, pathways or um, development for practical on the ground solutions on a daily basis. My involvement has been since 2014 in Gaza, initially in psychosocial health. It evolves to food security, food so sovereignty, I should say, um, and then it evolves to desperation and survivability. So food um, growing by the women uh, uh, agripreneurs, um, 3,000 micro enterprises in, in Gaza, uh, most destroyed, and only 20% survive. Uh, to some degree, they provide more than, or a, a very significant part of um, the survivability of that. Uh, plus, also um, uh, a health and uh, securing hospital equipment, for example, when it's right to be able to deliver. And so, these are kind of practical things that I tend to involve with. Um, I host every Thursday night, obviously not tonight, uh, discussion with people in Gaza when they can, or people who have escaped from Gaza. But I just want to see how we bridge this sort of discussion to those kind of practical um, uh, implementations. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we'll take one more question over here, and then we'll sorry, we'll sorry. Maybe two more questions and then get to the panel. So I don't think we have time for another round of questions. So I'll grab, the, grab them now and then. Thanks, if you can. Thanks again to the yeah. panel. I'll try to keep this short, and I hope that this bridges the two uh, questions prior to me. Um, as you all are probably aware that Cori Bush, the Democratic uh, Democrat from Missouri, has been pushed out of her seat and um, in favor of a pro-Israeli implant. And the um, American-Israeli Public Affairs Committee has taken credit for her loss. And so I was just wanting to hear a little bit more um, insight about that and um, as well as I just wanted to uh, emphasize that um, I'm a Deacon PhD student and this is the first formal conversation that Deacon has had about this. So I would also love to hear more about that because that has frankly really pissed me off. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, thanks. <laughs> well, thank you, really good questions. I mean, just quickly in response to that last point, um, I can't promise, but my hope, uh, inshallah, is that um, I can prevail on my panel members to come back later this year because we've only just started things. So at least we can hopefully we'll do that. Um, and one more question over here, then we'll go to the panel because we we are running out of time. So just over here, sorry, uh, Kira. Hello, fix the problem. It doesn't happen. <laughs> well, I I I, I <laughs> trust. I trust and hope there will be some developments over the next few months, and we it would make sense to come back and look at those developments. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I just wanted to say, I think the point that the speaker over there made earlier was um, really important. And, you know, I guess all of us who have kind of been following the Palestine movement over the past 10 months have kind of felt that despair, I guess, looking around the world, all of the institutions that kind of exist, like the UN, um, you know, the Australian government, um, all of the governments across the world kind of fail to really do anything to help the Palestinians. Um, but I think... Um, something like that ties into it, I guess, is like what the last two speakers on the panel mentioned. Um, and yeah, like, I think the answer kind of lies in 
the kind of movement all across the world that's exploded for Palestine um, since October 7. Um, like Yusuf said, um, historically in Australia, um, the movement for Palestine has kind of been uh, refined to um, Muslim and Arab communities and people on the far left, but um, a lot of people have kind of ignored the issue until now. Um, but yeah, I think it's kind of just incredible. Like in Melbourne, um, I'm in Free Palestine Melbourne, but also a member of Students for Palestine. Um, there's been like, I think this Sunday will be the 45th week of um, protests, mass protests um, every single week. Um, the biggest ones were like 80 to 100,000 people. Um, before, um, you know, last year um, when the Nakba rally happened in May, there was, I think it was the first Palestine protest I ever went to and there was 200 people at it. And I was like, oh my God, so many people care about Palestine. And now kind of, you know, going to these rallies where even after 10 months, there's still thousands and thousands of people on the street um, is really important and just, yeah, kind of incredible and shows how much wider layers of society now kind of identify with the issue of Palestine and um, are willing to dedicate a lot of their time to fighting for it. And people still have an appetite to fighting for Palestine. Um, but also like the movement all across the world, um, the student movement, um, you know, kind of exploded in America, made its way here to Australia, the UK and Europe. Um, but also some of the most inspiring protest movements that I've seen um, have been in the Arab countries where, you know, the regimes have been um, largely complicit, I think, in um, the genocide that's happening in Palestine. Um, but, you know, even under dictatorships, um, mass protests have continued um, in Egypt and in Jordan. So, um, yeah, I guess my kind of question to the panel is what do you think the, um, yeah, like what's the importance of the protest movement around the world? Or, um, yeah, like what is the potential of the um, masses of the Arab world, um, not just the governments, but the people? Thank you. No, I think all of these four questions, I'm sorry, we're I'll have to go to the panel, otherwise we won't have any time to get a response from them. Um, all these four questions do uh, meet at a certain point. Uh, the question is, are things changing? How are they changing? What will the consequence be? So I'll, I'll pass the microphone along, and I'm assuming we're going to um, yeah, we'll, around the time we'll do our best. Yeah, we'll try, and, uh, try and keep it short. Um, just to, just to answer your question first, I think, uh, I think it was quite a good one, and I share your cynicism with the United Nations. Um, I think we do need to acknowledge what the United Nations is. It's not an independent institution. It is a collection of states. It is a collection of interests. Um, and it is, uh, it's, it's us. It's us as individuals as well who, who are in, in, not in most contexts, but um, where we're in a country where we can choose the people that we represent. Uh, and to sort of bring it all together in um, hopefully uh, in a kind of succinct way, the the cure to this is avoiding cynicism staying away from it's all the same these people are all the same well no we have an obligation to if there's two people who's convincible who's pressurable who can we make who can we change their mind right um, and we're seeing a, um, i've been following the yeah the cory bush story which um in american politics um I actually genuinely think that things are changing over there at a grassroots level um, in terms of sympathy for the Palestinians, in terms of sympathy for Gazans. I think that's real. I think it's finally pushing at the top. I mean, you look at the the Democratic candidate who, um, in Kamala Harris, who was fundamentally uh, and wholeheartedly supported by, by AIPAC, who has now come out and in the strongest possible terms, more than the president that she's serving under, has said we cannot look away, this is unacceptable. Yes, they're words. No, it's not enough. But convincible, pushable, movable. That's what we can do. We can empower people who are convincible and pushable. Um, I will also just, as a really quick anecdote, don't worry, not too long, um, cast your mind back. It's really hard to remember prior to October 7th. Israel, um, Benjamin Netanyahu spoke in front of the General Assembly. Um, and everyone's forgotten about this because I bring it up to my students and they say, well, that didn't happen. I'm like, yes, it did. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu, as he does, he likes to use props. And he brought out a map and he had a picture of Israel. It was all colored in blue. And he had all the, all the states that had signed a peace accord with Israel and said, this is the new Middle East. Two months later, October 7th happens. And then suddenly... That new Middle East is shattered. The other thing that I have hope for is actually a, a little bit of cynicism is okay in the sense that the hope I have is that is, is the truth, that Israel knows that this it cannot win this war. 
it cannot, that its people cannot be safe unless occupation ends. Because I guarantee you, that is the conversation that will have to be had with Israel. And that's the external pressure that I think it will come from is other states saying, no, no, you're delusional about this. You cannot have victory this way. And we won't let it happen. Thanks. Um, I, I find it interesting that all the questions kind of had this common theme, which on the one hand, everyone's feeling a lot of despair and pain, but trying to cling on to the hope. Um, and I, I think that is really important um, not to give up on that hope. And I do think um, like political and public and expressions of that is really important. As we're saying, we can't just rely on on governments and, and international organisations. And I think the idea of the public conscience and people expressing their views and coming out in numbers and well, is really important because the idea of a national interest shouldn't just be this very narrow idea of a national interest, but it should be taking into the account the views of citizens of your country and this idea of not in my name. So I think that that needs to continue, but I do think it's important for that to be coupled with political realism, which is why I said some of the things in my like um, earlier points, not because I was trying to prioritise one side, but more just in terms of we need to try and keep in mind the political reality if what we want is to bring about change. And so that realism is important without trying to um, give in to the, the cynicism. Um, so that's just a general thing. And the question about um, what um, doing practical things and what you can learn from the discussion, I think if anything, it should be the other way around. And I think it's really admirable. I mean, what you're doing, it's just fantastic. If only a lot of the people that are the pundits and pontificating about it were had more of a insight and actual connection with what's going on, that would be great. So thank you. Thank you. I'd like to reflect on the questions, but also I would like to be given one more minute at the end to explain um, the visualization of the ongoing Nakba. So um, what can be done uh, when there is no hope and when, there, when things don't look, uh, when things look very uh, sad and despairing? And I remember uh, a quote from uh, the late uh, Tunisian president, uh, Bourguiba. I know uh, Fathi would like that. I can see Fathi. Uh, where is Fathi? He's busy. Okay. Late uh, Tunisian president, the founder of contemporary Tunis, uh, Bourguiba, said, Khud wa talib, take what's offered and ask for more. Fathi, we were speaking about you. I'm quoting, I'm quoting, I'm quoting uh, Bourguiba in his slogan, Khud wa talib, take what's offered and ask for more. We should also build on uh, Andrew's uh, idea of build on any good, even if it's not enough even if it doesn't sound or doesn't look enough. Build on it, do not dismiss it. Uh, sorry, uh, your question, what was your name? Your, your question, yes. Oh, Gary. Gary, very important question. In times of political, uh, in, in times of polarization, we should not forget the people on the ground. We should not forget the, on, the, 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 the work in the field, particularly medicine, particularly education and, um, solving unemployment and in fact the future of the palestinian israeli conflict is about demography and the more you keep people on their homes the more likely you are going to win the conflict in fact there was an israeli theorist i think his name is safran who said that the future of the palestinian israeli conflict will not be determined in battlefields but in bedrooms more babies and the Demography is not just having more people, but also maintaining their decent life. And you cannot maintain people's decent life without investing in education, in medicine, in even arts, in, uh, in, in civil society building. And that is why before the 7 October events, there was an interesting conference in Herzliya, Israel, talking about the future of Zionism. When all of a sudden, since, since Nakba, the Zionists conference uh, realized that 
we we have outnumbered them for the first time since i mean by we i mean the non-jewish elements from the river to the sea uh there are for the first time since nakba more arabs to the west of the river and to the east of the mediterranean than jews and there was a debate of what needs to be done to this demographic threat and there were two opinions one opinion is let's lock them in in their state let's call it palestine two state the revitalization of two two state solution but a state without sovereignty where the palestinian state will not control its sky or its human resor uh, water resources and its borders with egypt and in with jordan but at least they can you know we can confine them to this uh, state but the other the other opinion one which is back to ethnic cleansing and this is the context of the genocide in gaza the transfer the ethnic cleansing the genocide let's make gaza not inhabitable and then we'll go to west bank and there will be and god forbid there will be something happening in west bank not not identical to what we see in gaza but i'm worried that something will there will be violence where we need to drive more arabs uh, out of the future palestinian state if there will be a, a, a palestinian state so the key to keeping the palestinians in palestine is decent life is employment is education I also want to reflect on, um, um, sorry, your your name, Rene. Rene's uh, what can be done? Future uh, um, Free Palestine movement, and the boom and the boost in the Palestinian uh, representation in Australia. At least our government can no longer say Australians support Israel. When we keep taking to street, when we keep praising the Palestinian flag. When we keep saying free Palestine, then our prime minister, our government cannot get away with that bold uh, uh, claim that Australia stands with Israel, not in our name. So keep going. And I will just share a short story of my uncle who was born in 1948. I, in, in part of my writing uh, project, I collect stories about the Nakba survivors. survivors. And I asked him, Ammo, what's the happiest day of your life? And what's the saddest day of your life? Not going to talk about the saddest day of his life, but I will tell you what the happiest day of his life. He was born in 48 in a village near between, uh, Ramle and Yafa called Majdal Yaba. And when he was uh, 10, he found himself in a refugee camp near Jericho called uh, called Aqab al Jabr, living in inhumane conditions, living in sheer poverty, in dire need for like everyone else in the camp. And then in year four, then came an advocate or an activist from the United States to the camp, and he spoke to the principal, and he said, "I want to take the kids in a tour." So he hired a, a van. He hired a bus, he paid for a driver, and he bought them lunch, he bought them fizzy drinks. And he said, the first time I had fizzy drinks in my life was when that activist came and bought us Bibsi. We don't have P in Arabic. <laughs> and he saw Palestine. It was the first time he got to see Palestine. Other places in West Bank and proper, and, and basically Palestine in 48 areas. And that American man gave him the happiest day in his life. So do not belittle what you do for Palestinians here in Melbourne. Thank you. Um, out of because of time, I'll perhaps just say something um, that connects to your final story, and and that's the issue of solidarity. That I really think is, you know, if, if we want to think about what's where the hope lies, I think, or, or what the meaning of process of, you know, protest is solidarity. And um, so you mentioned you collect stories about the Nakba. And I have an uncle who lives in Sweden, and his mother was killed by a suicide bomber on um, 30 years ago on Passover night. And he did a documentary trying to find the family of the suicide uh, bomber. And there is a documentary on this. And then he 
dedicated and he had uh, so he is a historian and a journalist and he had a podcast um on holocaust survivors um in the past but after this incident he um started collecting stories of nakba survivors and now he has an exhibition that just opened in in uh in malmo uh in sweden uh, just a few months ago uh collecting and sharing the stories and images of nakba survivors and using that as a part of both kind of bringing back humanity looking at people seeing people for who they are acknowledging pain and you know using who we are as humans to promote solidarity and i think uh, i'll uh, just end with that because i know we're out of time and i hope that that you know a bit of a, the only <laughs> a bit of hopeful uh, hopeful thing i can i can share thank you thank you very much for it. Uh, you said you said something about one minute at the end. Did you want to? Yes. Um, okay. Can I? I'll make a couple of housekeeping statements, and then we'll come to you for the, the last word. Um, so yes, very good point. We should be talking about this more. Um, I'll just point out a couple of things, before, lest I forget. It would be a, a pity to uh, acknowledge that um, not acknowledge that we have an annual Middle East Studies Forum conference coming up. Uh, Andrew and uh, and Tima leading that on the seventh and eighth of seventh yeah, um, and eighth of October. Yeah. Um, yeah, two days um, where it's very similar context to this, where we're talking about sort of the um, how from a bunch of different perspectives, international politics, and uh, we've got anthropologists, we've got uh, lawyers, I think Shiri, Shiri's got a panel, I think you've got a panel on there, um, all sorts of different panels um, is an academic forum, but it is obviously open to everyone. Um, and yes, we absolutely should be doing more of them, um, especially now. Uh, so um, hopefully, I mean, again, as um, as uh, Yusuf said, hopefully we don't have to do too many of these on specifically on Gaza, but um, we will. We, we uh, as as an institute, I think ADI wants to really uh, dig deep um, and not superficially into this subject. So um, look out for that and uh, sign up now. Yeah. yeah. So that's on our website. Also, at the end of November, um, we have an a ADI annual conference, and we will certainly be discussing these issues at that uh, end of November conference. So if you look at our website, you'll find it. We have these public policy forums um, three, generally four times a year. We'll have another one on the 5th of September, looking at migration. Um, here, here at Deakin Downtown, you'll find information on our site. And we haven't yet fixed our fourth uh, public policy forum for this year, but if we can, if it's possible with the panel and circumstances allow, we will come back and pick up this conversation because there's much more to be said. But over to you, Yusuf. Thank you. I want to show you a picture. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be clear from here, but let me try. This is a picture of an 80 something year old Palestinian woman in Gaza whose house was bombed in November 23. And this is how she was carried between the gravel, between in the, from the middle of the destruction by, by basically people, neighbors, maybe relatives. And I asked myself, what else did this woman see before this picture? What else? Let's put this picture aside. It's very hard for pictures to stand out in the middle of millions of pictures that's coming out. And speaking of iconic pictures, Maybe the iconic picture of the civil war in Syria is the picture of people leaving like the ocean from one narrow. You may have seen that picture. It's from Yarmouk camp. It's from Palestine. It's from the Palestinian camp. So even within the Syrian context, the Palestinians gave the conflict the most iconic picture. Back to the, to the elderly woman. I said, I, 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 I actually tried to find out more about her, and I found more information about her. And she was born in 1938. She was 10. She was born in Yaffa. She was 10 when she was made, she was made a refugee, and she was ethnically cleansed to what later became a refugee camp in Gaza. And she was 18 in 1956 when Israel, Britain, and France bombed Gaza as part of the Egyptian war of the Suez Canal crisis. And she was 29 in 1967 when Israel 
occupied her refugee camp in Gaza, the rest of Gaza, all of West Bank, all of Jerusalem, all of Sinai, all of the Golan Heights in the Six Day War in 1967. And she was 49 in the first Intifada of 1987. The Intifada of Stones it was non-militant. There was some military elements in it, but it was mainly the people's protest for statehood. The slogan was for a Palestinian state. The slogan was, uh, was PLO, Israel, no. This was the simple slogan of 1987. She was... 49, and the defense minister back then, Isaac Rabin, the man who won the Nobel Peace Prize, imposed what we know, the bone-breaking policy. Bone-breaking, like literally bone-breaking. You cannot stop the Intifada without crushing the spirit and break their bones. And she was 62 in the second Intifada of September 2000. According to Israeli archives, Israel, Israeli army fired one million bullets in the first, on the first day of the second intifada. I'm not exaggerating. Israel fired one million bullets against Palestinian targets on the first day of the second intifada in September 2000. And she was 69 in 2007 when Gaza became under tightened siege until today. And she's now over 80. And Israel came after her and destroyed her house. Yes, she was spared, but many of her children and daughters and granddaughters were killed. This is the definition of ongoing Nakba, layer by layer, day by day, shades and shades of injustice. So if we want to talk about Palestine, we have to allow the imagination and the willingness to listen more to learn more and to approach it with no predetermined uh, views. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all to the panelists. Thank you, Yusuf, for your final words and the panelists. And as I said, uh, God willing, if we can make it happen, we will come back with the panel and, and revisit this. Um, but please look at our website for information. There's other things we've mentioned. Thank you for coming tonight.